Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Hey, it's great to have you join us uh, online today, and uh, we just want to extend to you a very, very uh, happy day of victory today, and we pray that God is really blessed. We're ready to have a really scrumptious lunch. We're going to find some Easter eggs. We're going to be hunting a rabbit, but not the Easter bunny. So we want to bless you today, and uh, we look forward to getting together with you real soon. Have a wonderful day. Happy Easter. We love you. Well, greetings, Ascent Global Church and uh, all our online visitors and friends and uh, a great happy Easter to you and uh, welcome to our Easter morning service. Uh, we can't gather together, but we can be together online and certainly the presence of God that comes whenever we pray and do this is going to come not only into our house as we gather together, but it's also going to come for you as well. So uh, I want to share this morning on the Passover and uh, the significance and meaning of the Passover. I want to have a look, first of all, what the Passover is. Uh, I want to look at the spiritual significance of the feast and uh, what it really means, what happened, and, uh, and, and the benefits and blessings that outflow to us and then what we could simply do to make it part of our life. Because so many people, when they think about Easter, they don't understand really what it's about. We know about the death and resurrection of Christ. But let me just share a little bit more. First of all, what is the Passover? And we want to read from Leviticus chapter 23, verses 1 through to 5. And uh, here they are. You can follow it online or follow it in your, in your own Bible. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, the feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations or gatherings, these are my feasts. And six days will work be done, and the seventh day is the Sabbath, the solemn rest, the holy convocation. You should do no work on it. It's the Sabbath of the Lord and all your dwellings. Now he speaks of the Passover. These are the feasts of the Lord, holy gatherings or convocations, which you shall proclaim at the appointed times. On the 14th day of the first month, at twilight, is the Lord's Passover. And then he goes through and he describes then three particular feasts. And uh, notice the first thing is these are the feasts of God. They originated from God himself. So therefore, these have a heavenly design about them. They have a God-ordained purpose about them because God never does anything at random. So three times a year, the people of God were called to gather together to celebrate these three feasts. The feast, uh, firstly, the feast of Passover, which is on the 14th day of the first month. And that was made up of three parts. It had the Passover itself, uh, which we're going to look at today. The feast of unleavened bread, which is on the 15th. And uh, then the, the first fruits, where they offered the first fruits of the harvest to the Lord. And all of these, of course, are, are have spiritual significance. The second feast was the Feast of Pentecost. And that was 50 days later. It was also called the Feast of Weeks. And that was the beginning of the harvest. And then in the uh, seventh month, there was the Feast of Tabernacles. This also had three parts. It began with the Feast of Trumpets, the blowing of trumpets. Then there was the Day of Atonement. And then there was the Feast of Booths, where they uh, remembered uh, and celebrated God's harvest together. So I want to go through because these were things that were set up by God. And when God sets something up, he always has design and purpose in it. And as we understand the feasts, then we understand the purpose. Now, clearly, if God has set up three, set, uh, three major feasts, they all have a significance. And today is too short for us to go through them. We want to look at one and only one part of one, which is the feast, uh, the feast of Passover. So before I go into the details of the feast and how it was celebrated, uh, we ask the question then, what is the spiritual significance of the feasts? They came from God, they're God ordained, there's always a purpose. So what was their significance? And let me just take this, give me this right now. The feasts are gateways to the supernatural power of God. Let me say that again. The feasts are gateways or entry points to access the supernatural power of God. So when you look at each of the feasts, you have to think not in terms of just, we come together and have a celebration, we have a meal and do these kind of things. You have to understand that they were designed as an access point for the power of God to come. And uh, you'll see naturally, uh, there was the power of God released uh, in, the, in the people of Israel, but spiritually there's a release of power associated with each of the feasts and the keeping of those feasts. So uh, we want to have a look at this. Just, uh, let me just give you some, some clear scripture things from this. Just 
how each of the feasts had power associated with it. Firstly, the Passover, the Feast of Passover, and we'll go into the details of that a bit more. But let me read from 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7 and 8, where Paul is writing. He says, Purge out the old leaven, that there may be that you may be a new lump, since you are truly unleavened, for indeed Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. So he now connects very clearly that Christ is the fulfillment of the Passover. Something Christ did is the fulfillment of that original Passover feast that was practiced uh, all through the history of Israel. And so he says in verse 8, let us keep the feast. So he's not saying we abandon it or we forget about it or we change its name or we put something else in as a substitute. He's saying we need to keep the feast, but we keep it with a spiritual perspective, what it really meant, not with the old leaven, which is the leaven of malice and wickedness or sin, but the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So he's saying that every aspect of the Feast of Passover, including the Feast of Unleavened Bread, there is a way it applies to our life that brings the release of God's presence and power to us. So we see we are to keep the Feast of Passover, uh, and Christ is the true Passover. He's the fulfillment of the natural feast. Now, when Jesus died on the cross, when Jesus... Uh, who was the Lamb of God, gave up his life on the cross, which was the Passover being fulfilled, we find there's immense power of God released accompanying that event. Let's have a look. In Matthew 27, verse 53 to 53, Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. He died on the cross. And behold, now there's a release of supernatural power. So the offering of Jesus as the Lamb of God, as the fulfillment of Passover, now we see God responds with release of power. And it's truly a principle. Whenever we make sacrifice offering to God in the spirit of faith, there is a release of power of some kind into our life. And it says, behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook. There was an earthquake, a great earthquake, a powerful earthquake. It was so powerful, it says the rocks were split. Then it says it was not only so powerful, the graves were opened. And then many of the bodies of the saints who have fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after the resurrection, they went into the holy city and paired to all or to many. So we see associated with the fulfillment of the feast spiritually when Christ died on the cross, we see the release of supernatural power. So great supernatural power was released when Jesus died on the cross. And symbolically, the tearing of the veil meant that access is now made for every person potentially into the presence of God. An open door to access the resources of heaven is available for us. So the power of sin and its consequences have been overcome by the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the Passover with the resurrection of Jesus, uh, it all releases power to bring transformation in our life and to give us access. It releases power to free us from sin and bondages. We'll look at that a little later. And it releases power to transform us and give us access into the realm of God. The second feast was the Feast of, Pente of Pentecost, also known as the Feast of First Fruits. And that was 50 days after uh, the Feast of Passover. And we find that 50 days after Jesus had given his life on the cross, it says in Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost had fully come. Now, Jesus had instructed his disciples, I've given you a commission, but stay in the city of Jerusalem until you receive power from on high. So notice now it's at the day of Pentecost. So the feast of Pentecost was naturally being fulfilled. The city of Jerusalem was full of people crowding in to celebrate that feast coming from all over Israel. And the real fulfillment of Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. When the day of Pentecost had fully come and they were with one accord in one place, suddenly there came a sound from heaven like a rushing mighty wind. It filled the whole house where they were sitting. Notice the house. And it says, there appeared to them divided tongues of fire and one sat on each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. So notice, Pente Passover, power is released, a great supernatural power. And now Pentecost, also great supernatural power is released. And so we saw with Passover, access is given into the presence of God. Now in Pentecost, access is given to the power of God 
a door is open for the supernatural to empower us in the commission to carry the gospel out. And the Bible says that with great power, the disciples gave witness to the resurrection of Christ. You notice associated with the feasts is access to the supernatural power of God. There's always something associated with it. So that brings us to the third feast. Now, literally the third feast has not been yet fulfilled. The third feast is the feast yet to come. And uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, also the Feast of Harvest. Uh, in Deuteronomy 11, verse 14, oh, let me read two or three verses on this. It says, then, that's at this time, he said, I will give you the rain for your land in its season, the early rain and the latter rain, that you may gather in your grain, your new wine and your oil. So notice he speaks about the early rain that came at the Feast of Pentecost. Then there's a latter rain that comes at the Feast of Tabernacles, and the latter rain causes the harvest to come to its fullness. So the harvest needed the early rain to cause the seeds to sprout, and it needed the latter rain to bring the full harvest to maturity. So we see rain always is a, is a picture of the, the presence of God, the power of God, the, the movement of the Holy Spirit. It comes from heaven and it waters the earth to bring forth fruit. And uh, so we see then, he says, I promise that I'll give you the early rain and the latter rain. So it's a reference then to the outpouring of the Spirit, firstly at Pentecost, and now there is a much greater, much heavier rain, much greater move of God. There is an end time outpouring of the power and glory of God. Oh, how exciting. I'm excited just looking at it and, and, and meditating on this again. Now, uh, let me just read something else. This is found in Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 16. Now, this is not something that's going to be in a, a little. This is something of global significance. That's what it says. And you, you might, you, I suggest you look at these verses yourselves. In Zechariah chapter 14, verse 16, it said, It'll come to pass, everyone is left of all the nations that came against Jerusalem shall go up, all of the nations shall go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And it shall be, that whichever of the families of the earth or the nations of the earth do not come up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, on them there will be no rain. Now, there's a lot we could share about this, but what he's saying is at the end time, at the coming of the Lord, when he comes and uh, manifests in Jerusalem and manifests his presence, manifests his power, manifests his glory, it says then, all of the nations shall come up every year to keep the feast. So this is not just something that's just a, a one-off fulfillment. This is something that will actually be celebrated like the Hebrews celebrated each of the feasts every year. Now there'll be a celebration, but it will be global. It will be all Gentile nations. And it says if people won't respond to this, then the heaven will withhold its rain. Maybe literally there's a drought, but possibly it also refers that there's a withholding of the presence, the power, the blessing of God because they won't give honor to Jesus Christ who has come. So yet to come is the greatest revelation of the glory and power of God that will affect all nations of the earth. No nation will be left out. This is a global revival, uh, a move of the glory of God. Notice what it says in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 14. It says, for the earth or the whole earth will be filled with knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. In other words, it doesn't say it'll just be filled with the glory. It said be filled with knowledge of the glory. This is not something hidden. This is something manifest openly. Jesus manifested his glory when he turned the water into wine. So it's talking then about a massive outpouring of the Holy Spirit of miracles, uh, creative miracles, uh, miracles over creation, uh, all kinds of of supernatural signs and wonders, which have been seen in the Bible in little glimpses. And now God is reserved to the last days, the days we live in, a major outpouring. How amazing is that? So you can see then there's a lot to learn about each of the feasts. And if you go through and study the feasts, then you'll get lots of insight to all of these things. But we want to focus just on the Passover. And so let me, it's taken me a while, but I get to the Passover now. So what, is it, what does the Passover mean? Well, the first thing to realize is that the meaning was intentionally removed of the Passover. The meaning of the Passover was intentionally removed from the church 
by Constantine, the Emperor Constantine, the Roman Emperor, in AD 325. And of course, and the subsequent emperor put people in prison and punished those who kept them. They were put to death. It was a capital offense to keep the feasts of the Jews. So in other words, the Emperor Constantine instituted a movement to eradicate out of the church all association with Israel, all association with our Hebrew roots, all association with the original feasts of Israel. And what he wanted to do was to replace it. So he re literally, he removed what God ordered, the Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles, the Passover, and instead put in a substitute. Well, what was the substitute? Remember, a substitute maybe looks like or resembles the original, but it's not the original. Substitute's a replacement. And if you replace something that God has ordained, you can't expect it to have his endorsement and power. So what did he replace it with? What did he replace it with Easter? Where did the name Easter come from? Well, it came, uh, it was named after the uh, false god, the, which was a god worshipped in Rome and also quite widely through the history uh, in the Babylonian culture and also by the Hebrews when they fell away from the living God. It was named after Astarte, you get the word Easter, uh, Ishtar, which turns up in the Bible, or Ashtoreth, which is the one most commonly that the Hebrews would turn away towards and worship when they fell away from the Lord. And that was the goddess of love and fertility, of temple prostitution, of the offering of infants and sacrifice. And uh, it's the God that led Solomon astray. So notice what he's done. He's removed the feast of Passover and everything associated with it. Instead, he's tried to make a feast that will include pagans, that will include the worshippers of Astarte and include Christians. And so he's put it on uh, the celebration, called it Easter, and it's tried to be all-inclusive or it's tried to compromise or bring a mixture in so that the original is lost and now you have something that's a mixture. That's where you get the whole thing of eggs. Eggs were a symbol of productivity, so colored eggs were exchanged. Uh, we get the symbol of uh, rabbits, of course, associated with fertility. That's where all of this comes from. It comes from something in AD 325 when Constantine intentionally removed the, the meaning and the uh, practice of the feasts so that there'd be a disconnection of the church from its Hebrew roots, a dishonoring of our roots. And of course, this has led to all manner of problems. So we need a revelation again of the power associated with those feasts. In Ephesians 1 verse 18, Paul's prayer is that the eyes of your understanding may be enlightened. You may know what is the hope of his calling, the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. What is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe which, uh, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and name, which may be named in this life and the age to come, and made him head of his body, the church, the fullness of him. So you notice there it's saying he's praying. You need, we need the spirit of wisdom and revelation. We need a revelation of the power available to us. See, if you have no revelation of the power, you will end up with an empty practice. You'll end up celebrating or doing something, and it's just all the form, but there's no power in it. It has the form of a godliness. So it's a celebration, but it's devoid of the power that God intended you to access. It's devoid of the reality of the supernatural God intended you to access. So what happened in the original Passover is this. Let's go through it and let me highlight a few things so we understand then what the Passover is about. And we read this in Exodus chapter 12, and I encourage you to read right through it and do your own study in it, highlight your Bible so you make yourself a student of the Word, and then check through the Bible about the Passover. There was uh, one change made after this original Passover. This is the original one. Now, in Exodus 12, Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be the beginning of months, it shall be the first month of the year to you. So God's altering the calendar. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying on the 10th day of this month, every man, every man, every man shall take for himself a lamb according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of persons. According to each man's need, you shall make for the count of the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish. A male of the first year, you may take it from the sheep or the goats. You shall keep it till the 14th day of the same month. So it's chosen on the 10th day, kept till the 14th day. Then the whole assembly of the congregation shall kill it at twilight. 
and they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts on the lintel of the houses where they eat. And they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted and fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Don't eat it raw or boiled with water, but roasted and fire, head and legs and entrails. You should let none remain till the morning. What remains till the morning you shall consume or burn completely in the fire. And this is how you'll eat it. Uh, with a belt on your waist, with sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand, eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both man and beast, against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And uh, he said, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Oh, sorry. It says, now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I'll pass over. I'll pass over you and the plague will not be on you to destroy when I strike the land of Egypt. And this shall be, this day shall be to you a memorial and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. Now, it's a temporary ordinance. It's everlasting. It's something to be remembered all through time, not to be taken and substituted with something else. So, let me just go through and, and highlight a few things that come out of it. Of course, you, we can study these. and There's a lot on every one of them, but you, you just find it fascinating. Firstly, Egypt, it, it refers to Egypt. Uh, Egypt, of course, is the place of slavery, of bondage, of cruel taskmasters. So Egypt is a symbolically spiritual picture of us, our life in the world without Christ. Uh, it says uh, they, were, uh, they were ruled over by taskmasters. They were in bondage. There was no freedom. The Bible tells us in Romans 6, 17, that whatever you, who, whoever you serve is your master. So if we serve sin, then sin is our master. And so before we come to Christ, we are like them in Egypt, in the world, in the bondage to sin, accessed by demons and caused torment and pressure and driven. We lack peace and joy and we seek to try and find substitutes, temporary comforts. Notice the second thing he says there, this shall be a new beginning or it'll be, it'll be a, the beginning of the, of the year. It'll be a new, so the year began with the Passover. How about that? So they had to alter their calendar. So the first month of the year was when the Passover was celebrated. And what that symbolizes is that the Passover introduces us to a whole new beginning. And of course, in the New, Korea, in the new Testament, 2 Corinthians 5, 16, it says, if any man is in Christ, if you've received Christ, our Passover, then you are a new creation. Behold, all things are become new. You are born again. You've come into a new beginning. So everyone gets a new beginning. And the key point of that new beginning is the Passover, the reality of the power of Christ transforming us, setting us free from Egypt. Uh, the next thing we notice in the passage there, it said uh, a lamb will be chosen for a house. So every household had to have a lamb, a lamb for a house. And the Bible tells us, John 1, 29, that behold, Jesus, um, John the Baptist said, behold, this is Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. In uh, 1 Corinthians 5, 7, we saw Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. And in Revelation 13, verse 8, it says that Jesus was the Lamb slain from before the foundations of the world. So the Lamb that was chosen was chosen by God the Father himself. God the Father chose Jesus to be our lamb, to be our representative. So we don't have to go out and choose a lamb. God chose a lamb. We have to choose whether we'll accept that provision and what that means. Uh, the uh, Notice the lamb was for a house. So it was always for a household, not just for an individual. In the West, we tend to think of our faith as being individual, but the biblical perspective is always about community. It's about the whole family belonging to the household of God. Uh, notice the next thing is the lamb had to be spotless. Uh, in uh, 1 Peter 1, verse 18 and 19, it says Christ is a lamb without blemish. So Jesus Christ himself was totally spotless, free from sin, born without sin, born and lived uh, in victory over sin. And so the lamb, every lamb that was selected for this had to be uh, spotless. So, so the next thing we saw, it was kept. It was kept from the 10th day to the 14th day. And every day they would check it over. So it had four checks before it was offered. And each of the checks was to check no fault, no fault, no fault. Isn't it amazing of Jesus Christ that Jesus Christ was checked by four people? He was checked by Pilate. Pilate said in John 19, 4, I find no fault in him. 
he was checked by Annas, the high priest. I find no fault. He couldn't find fault. They couldn't find accusers. They couldn't, they had to make up charges against them. Uh, Caiaphas, they couldn't find fault either. They had to trump up charges and Herod couldn't find fault either. So he was inspected four times, fulfilling exactly the Passover lamb. Uh, the, uh, we see also that the, the father, the, the father had to choose the lamb and, sh and, and kill the lamb and apply the blood. So God endorses way back there that the father of every household had a responsibility as the head of the household, as the priest, to take hold of and apply the blood of Jesus Christ over the door or the, 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 the lintel and the doorposts. Uh, it was his responsibility. And of course, in the New Testament, it, it tells us in 1 Corinthians eleven three that the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. He says the head of the family. So there's, it's a spiritual positioning and a responsibility. So if you're a man, you have a responsibility. Your responsibility is to take spiritual leadership in the home. Your responsibility is to bring the family to Christ. Your responsibility is to apply the blood of Jesus Christ in prayer over the household to keep them and guard them from demonic power, to provide a spiritual umbrella for your family, for your wife, for your family. And uh, so the blood, of course, was, uh, it was the blood of the lamb was, uh, when the lamb was slain, the blood was put in a basin. And uh, it tells us a little later in Exodus 12 that Moses instructed them, take some hyssop and uh, swirl it around in the, in the blood and then strike the blood on the lintels, right on the, on the, on the top of the doorway, on the side. So they put, it, they put it on the ground to be trampled underfoot. They put it on the two doorposts and the lintel. So you would come in and, and that was uh, to equivalent of the whole household. So it had to be applied in three different places. And uh, we see that the Bible tells us that in Exodus chapter 34 and verse six and seven, it says that God forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Transgression, we deliberately break the law of God. Sin, we just fall short of God's uh, plan and best for us. Iniquity is the crookedness in our lives. So the blood is applied to all three things. God wants us to be free and covered by his blood from not only deliberate intentional failures we make, breaking the laws of God, uh, but also the unintentional ones where we fall short and also free and, and cleansed from the iniquity, which is often generational in origin. And so there's a way this can be applied. And uh, so it was applied by hyssop. And uh, so the hyssop uh, is, uh, is a picture for us of faith, because by faith, we have access to the things of God. I must believe and give voice to my belief. So we, it's the confession of faith that applies the blood to my life, to my mind, my heart, my conscience, to my marriage, to my finances, to my children, to my household, we must actually speak words from a heart that believes. And so 1 Corinthians 1, 9, 1 John 1, 9, it says, if we, confess, if, we, uh, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Notice there's a, that we have to speak homologia, to say the same thing God says. So it requires of us then that we be vocal. And so the Bible tells us very clearly, if you believe in your heart that uh, Jesus Christ is Lord, died on the cross for your sins and rose again from the dead and confess with your mouth. So there's, there has to be words spoken. We need to not just pray quiet prayers. We need to articulate and speak. So the blood is applied by speaking words from a heart that believes that what God says the blood does, it does it. And uh, so that's so it's very powerful in our praying. So as we come into the presence of God, we always come by the blood of Jesus Christ. We'll see that in a moment. So there was a meal eaten together. They ate the meal together, which uh, speaks again of a family engagement together. So as a family, as one family, uh, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 14 says that, no, we, we, we don't, we're not on our own in this. We are members of a body. So that's why we gather together. We have the service of communion together, which is the way we outwork and remember the Feast of Passover. Uh, but it's also something you can do in your home, which I hope you'll do in your home today. And Joy and I will do this together. And uh, notice the meal was eaten also with bitter herbs. And uh, that was a reminder 
for them. It wasn't for flavoring. It was a reminder that before we came to Christ, our life was in deep and bitter bondage. Exodus 1.14 says they were in bitter bondage in Egypt with cruel taskmasters. So our life before we came to Christ was, was bitter and hard. And, and it was usually because it was so hard and bitter, we came to him and trusted him. And then he brought us out of the bondage we were in into a new life. Uh, they ate it with unleavened bread. So unleavened, the word leaven in the Bible, or leaven is just yeast. And yeast, a little bit of yeast will spread and, and inflate the whole of the bread, blow it all up, make it beautiful. However, the Bible uses the word leaven. Mostly it refers to sin. Sin starts small and then it spreads and right through. So in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, talking about celebrating this feast of Passover, it says, purge out the old leaven. So what the Hebrews had to do was they, they ate the feast with unleavened bread, which was to bring to mind there was to be no sin, that they were to actually repent of sin and to commit to a holy life. In fact, the whole week they had the, uh, the feast of unleavened bread, and so there was no leaven in their house all that week. And uh, so this is a picture for us of our need to repent of sin and to commit to a life of holiness, not just living a casual life of compromise and, and just having a little bit of God, a little bit of the world. Rather, it's a life uh, that's, uh, that's committed to the Lord. Notice this, it says that they had to be dressed ready to leave. So in other words, the mentality of the Passover is I'm departing from an old life and coming into a new life, a new experience and into an inheritance in the Lord. And so James 4 verse 4 says, friendship with the world or when I embrace and hold the word's value and lifestyle, then I'm in hostility towards God. So to, to, to have unleavened bread and remove leaven out of your house, and they actually had to remove the leaven out of their house, they had to celebrate with unleavened bread, and they had to be ready to travel or ready to leave the old familiar life behind. And this is often something that people find very difficult. It's more comfortable to stay, but God calls us to a life of faith, a life of walking with him by faith, of walking a different path. That's why people say, well, this is strange. You would let go what you were a part of, but this is all part of the Passover is that we let go the old life that we can access the things that God has. Because when God was talking to Moses, he said, uh, I want you to speak to Pharaoh let, Pharaoh, let my people go that they may serve me. So the Passover is the power of God released to free us from sin and the world, but it's to bring us into a journey where we learn to serve God. And so God spoke to Moses and said, I want you to bring them to me, to an intimate connection and love relationship and marriage covenant with me. And then I will bring them into the promised land, into a land of inheritance. So the last couple of things about it, of course, is that this was a reminder we read there, it says, this shall be a memorial. A memorial means something to keep reminding you so you never forget it, never lose the value of it. You should keep it as a feast of the Lord throughout your generations and everlasting ordinance. And notice there, it's a reminder. What is a reminder of? That they needed to remember constantly with gratitude what the Lord had done, the price he had paid to set them free, where they'd come from and the, and the cost of that, of that freedom. So let, let's get on then. Well, what did, this, what did the blood uh, accomplish? Uh, well, the shed blood accomplished a lot. <laughs> Great power was released at that time. Uh, perhaps you haven't read it and seen it because sometimes it doesn't always say it, but you look into it and it tells us there in Psalm 105, 37, there wasn't one feeble one among them. That meant everyone received healing and strength as they celebrated the Passover. There was healing for them. And uh, later on in the Bible under Hezekiah, the whole nation was healed physically when they restored the Passover that had been abandoned. And not only that, they were released with great wealth. It says in Psalm 105 verse 37, he bought them forth with silver and gold. So they had 400 years of back pay. They came with silver and gold. There is power in the shedding of the blood to set us free from the past, to bring healing to our life and to provide abundantly for us. Oh my, what a great feast the feast of Passover is. So there, there are two key things that we, we look at in, uh, in relationship to the Passover. My thinking about it anyway today is this. Number one is redemption. We are redeemed with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. It tells us 
in, uh, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. We are redeemed. What does it mean to redeem? To redeem means, uh, literally means to free you from captivity by paying a ransom, uh, releasing you from blame, releasing you from debt. So, so to redeem means to provide you freedom. So one of the things that the Passover provides for us, the shed blood provides for us, is freedom. It's not automatic. You have to take hold of it by the application of the blood of Jesus by faith. And so the freedom or the, the redemption uh, that God provides for us is deliverance. It's healing. Uh, we are set free from sin. Sin is forgiven. Transgression forgiven. Iniquity forgiven. The power broken. We're set free from curses by the blood of Jesus. We're set free from shame by the blood of Jesus. We're set free from fear, especially the fear of death by the blood of Jesus. We're set free from poverty and lack by the blood of Jesus. We're set free, it tells in Isaiah, from griefs and sorrows by the blood of Jesus. We're set free from rejection and abandonment by the blood of Jesus. We're set free uh, from sickness and disease and brought into health. These have all been purchased for us by the blood that was shed. Oh, praise the Lord for the blood being shed. How exciting. Oh, the blood. There's power in the blood of Jesus to access and set me free from all these things. But, but it is not just that we're redeemed or set free or, or that something has been purchased for us. We've also been given access. Access means permission or freedom or ability to approach or to enter in. Access to many blessings is provided by the blood of Jesus, but they're not automatic. You take hold of them. So, so what, do we, what does the blood give us access to? Well, I mean, every one of these you could share something on. They're so exciting. Uh, we have access to the Father. We have access to the very throne of God by the blood of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2.18, we have access to the Father by one spirit. The blood of Jesus Christ has given us access to the presence of God. Wow, what a great blessing that is. Number two, uh, the blood of Jesus Christ has given us access to sonship. In Romans 8, 15 and 16, because of that blood being shed, we are now given sonship. God's spirit comes into our heart and now we're no longer slaves, we're sons. We're children of the living God. God's spirit witnesses with our spirit. We're children of God. You have access to sonship and all the privileges that go with that. It says in Romans 8, 15, we are co-heirs with Christ. So we have access to an eternal inheritance. You need to study and see what that inheritance is about and how we need to grow maturity to access all of that. Uh, we have access to blessings in Ephesians 1 and verse 3. It tells us now we are blessed with every blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So with every blessing, the blessing of health, the blessing of, 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 of provision, the blessings of uh, freedom, the blessings of peace, the blessings of oh, there's so many blessings that are available to us. What else is provided? What else do we have access to? Well, we have access to the priesthood. In Re Revelations 5, verse 9 and 10, it, it, it's, it, the, the, you see a vision into heaven. He said, uh, worthy is the lamb that was slain. You has made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on earth. How exciting is that? So we have access to priesthood, meaning we are given the privilege by the blood of Jesus of becoming a priest to God, of standing in his presence, acting his presence, being an intercessor for others who don't yet know him. And I thank God for the woman who prayed for me for so long that broke the power of bondage in my life and opened the way for God to transform me. We have access to kingship. To kingship means I have now authority to represent the Lord and to advance his kingdom with the power of God. Now, you need to understand that the Feast of Passover causes us to access all of these dimensions as well as being freed from things. So mostly people think just in terms of being forgiven their sin. But listen, there's far more to it than that. God set us free from a whole range of things that characterized a life which is without God. But he's also given us access to a whole range of things. And his desire is we, by faith, press in and take hold of those things. Oh, they sang a new song saying, you're worthy to take the scroll and open its seal. You were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and made us kings and priests to our God. And we shall reign on earth. In other words, it's not something for the future. It's now. It's now. Have you taken access? Are you accessing the Father daily and receiving his love and receiving his voice? 
Are you accessing your role as a son, your identity as a son, and coming to get to know your father and become like him and represent him? Uh, are you accessing the inheritance he's made available for you? Are you accessing the blessings and resources he's promised you? Uh, there's such a need at this time when we're facing a global turmoil that we have access to the supernatural provision of God. Are you standing up in your priesthood? and praying daily and interceding daily and offering the sacrifice of prayers, fastings, uh, giving. Uh, what about your kingship? Are you learning to stand up and exercise the authority given to you? My, even, even God spoke to Israel, I've called you to be a kingdom of priests. I've called you to myself, to intimacy. I've called you as my son, and I've called you to be kings and priests unto me. Wow. See, it's never been any different. These are the blessings of the Feast of Passover. We're just scratching the surface with Passover. Who more could be shared about it? So what could we do then? How can we celebrate the Passover? Well, here's, here's a few practical things. I think number one, learn about the Passover. Study it. Start to find out some things. Get some of Shane's teaching on the Passover or the feast and, and see how it was celebrated and find out the details of it. Remember, Constantine removed it and give us Easter. So if all you've got is Easter and you've got bunnies and rabbits and Easter eggs and you don't understand that even the whole time framework of it is not even correct. Jesus was crucified. He said he was, he was in the grave three days, three nights, which means he was crucified on the Wednesday, not on the Friday. Rose again, uh, perhaps in the early hours or in the dark on the, on the evening of the Saturday. So, so she, our, our inheritance has been stolen by religion. We need to get an understanding of this feast again. So as it comes to this time, great to celebrate Easter, great to do all those things, but don't have it devoid of encountering the power of God. So make, here's the second thing, make a family focus on Christ's death and resurrection. So when you gather for Easter as a family, center it at some point, the father puts especially, but if he's not in a place to do that, then someone needs to do that, needs to stand up and call the family to remember what it's all about, about the death of Jesus Christ, the feast of Passover, and about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the first fruits offering, which is part of the Passover. Here's another thing you could do. You could hold a communion service in your home. Why not do that? We're just going to do that. You could join us in just a moment to do that. Have a communion service and to pray and speak blessing over your family. When Jesus uh, held that communion service, uh, then it was not just a service. It's actually a, a, a way of remembering a new covenant, a new covenant, the spiritual reality of the Feast of Passover. It's a time to repent of sins and lukewarmness and compromise. Time to declare we're redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. It's a time to hold the blood of Jesus over your life and declare and apply it by the voice of your mouth to your life, to your family, especially at this time when the coronavirus has spread through the world. This is time to hold the blood of Jesus Christ because that brought healing and deliverance to them. We need to declare we're united with Christ, joined to him and risen with him. And remember, he's coming again. So I encourage you today to celebrate together this Feast of Passover as we're in this time of Easter. And uh, maybe right now you could join us uh, as we're going to just uh, have communion together. And I want to pray and bring blessing over you uh, as an apostle, uh, as a father, and uh, as your friend. What a brilliant word. Oh, I go. loved every bit of it. <laughs> oh, isn't it so good? I love the fact he brought us out that he might bring us in. Yeah. All the things that we have access to because of the blood. I think of the Old Testament picture too in the tabernacle. He went right behind the veil, which has been torn away now. But he had two things. He had the blood. Yes. And he had worship. Yes. Incense. Two things we need is worship and incense and the blood. And we got access right into the presence and power of God. Amen. Amen. I can't Wonderful. wait to see the church. Really full of that resurrection power. <laughs> this is the reason for the season. It's all about getting him right back in the central place. Realigning our lives with Jesus is the centre. Jesus is our Lord. Amen. He's re recentering us again, isn't he? He certainly is. Mm. He certainly is. Recentering our life on him. Amen. Amen. Well, why don't we do this? We should take the bread together. If you're with us at home, you can join us. And we've just got crackers here. That'll be, that'll do us. And uh, we remember together that the, the, the Jesus said we are one 
body. He said, this body was broken for you. And so if we take the bread, we break it and we take it together. We're reminded that we are one, but we're not doing this on our own. We are part of a community. We're part of a body. We're part, we're connected vitally with Jesus. So taking the bread uh, reminds us that we are connected and united with him. Now, united with him by faith, united with him by holding a, a living relationship with him. This is not an empty thing. If there's no living relationship with him, then this becomes very empty. So that's why we examine ourselves. Where am I in my relationship with God? Do I need to repent right now? Do I need to come and make my life right with God? Is there a compromise? lukewarmness, lack of passion. This is the time to repent. So Father, right now we yes, thank you. Yes. We thank you through this bread. We are reminded we are one with Jesus Christ today. We repent now of passivity. We repent of lukewarmness of any place in our life where there's a lack of passion, lack of fire, the lack of love. We've let, let go of that first love. We repent of any sin and compromise. We've allowed things to enter our life. Lord, today, especially at this time when there's such a, a danger uh, through the world, upheaval and turbulence in the world, we come back to you. We come back with a repentant heart. We come back with a hungry heart. And Lord, we come to you believing that you, Lord, are the giver of life. We are joined with you we have access to you we are seated with you yeah. in the heavenly places far above every principality and power so amen. Lord, we take this we yes. celebrate this together in jesus name amen amen, amen. i love the thought of the hyssop applying it by faith without faith there's no access hmm. Okay then, well, let's take the cup. And the cup is a reminder of the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for us. This blood is for you. Mm -hmm. This blood was shed for you, shed for me. The blood is a reminder of covenant. There's no covenant form without blood. It's a reminder of the price Jesus paid. It's a reminder of the power released from heaven when he shed his blood. Amen. Remember, when he shed his blood and gave his life, God responded. Yes. So when we take this in faith, God responds. Why don't you believe now as we have, as we drink together and to confess and declare together that God's power will touch you where you are. Mm. If you need healing, let's believe the healing right now. Yes. If you need a breakthrough, if you need deliverance, then believe for that deliverance right yeah. now. I'll pray for you for it in just a moment. So let's take the, the cup together now, Joy. Mm. A huge price was paid for us. We have very, real, very expensive real estate. Amen. Huge price was paid for us. Why don't you just, us. wherever you are now, just lift your hands to the Lord. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus yes. Christ. We declare the blood of Jesus Christ has redeemed us from the yes. bondage of sin, yes. has redeemed us from the bondage of all curses, has redeemed us from griefs and sorrows yes. and sickness, has redeemed us from poverty and given us access to every blessing. I speak now in Jesus' name. I take authority. I hold the blood of Jesus Christ. Yes. over this yeah, household, yes, thank you, Lord. over my family and my extended family. I hold the blood of Jesus Christ over the church, a same global church, Amen. over our pastors and our leaders and those who are watching online. Yes. I hold the blood of Jesus Christ thank over you, you. I declare today protection. I declare today no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Amen. I declare today the coronavirus shall not take any one of you. I decree in Amen. Jesus' name protection from the coronavirus. I take authority of every spirit of fear, particularly the fear of sickness and death. Uh, in Jesus' name, Amen. I command that spirit of fear to go. Oh, every yes, spirit God, producing God, heaviness, God, I command God, you yes, go in God. Jesus' name. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Uh, we had a bit of a break there because uh, my phone got full and ran out of data. And uh, anyway, we're back on again. And uh, just uh, we want to bless you. And uh, just as we finish today, we need to just provide an opportunity for you to be able to give you know when we come before the lord we come always we come before the king with something uh, we come with our praise we come with our worship we also come with our giving and uh, at a time like this knowing there's financial uncertainty ahead we want to make sure that we don't just forget neglect or overlook that giving is a part of our worship as well so up on the screen is going to come some ways you can give uh, through uh, either through the the app the push pay app or you could go online and go straight to the website of singglobalchurch.com and uh, just make a transfer there and uh, let's be faithful in the season when there is pressure when there is difficulty around us 
we, we, we make that decision, the Lord is first in my life. I honor him with the first fruits of my substance, the first fruits of my increase. I, I give him the very best. I give him the very first. I make sure that I, I never neglect that part of my relationship with him. And in doing so, it brings blessing on everything else. It means when I've given to the Lord in this way, I can then rest inside. I don't have to have any fear in my life. Now God's got my back in the area of finance and provision. He's a loving Father. I'm aligned with Him. His blessing is upon me. So Father, I just thank you right now for every person, uh, uh, both online and people who are part of the church family, uh, wherever they are. Father, right now, just put in their heart how they'll respond. And we thank you for your abundance. I release blessing over you. I command that every seed you sow into the house of God, every seed you sow into the global church, I command increase in blessing. And Father, we bring it before you as a memory that these are people of faith, people of covenant who are faithful to you. Amen. God bless you. And we'll see you again for a prayer meeting in the coming week. Amen. Bye.